Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another exciting virtual tour with the Foss Waterway Seaport. I'm your host, your guide, Chris, with Pretty Gritty Tours. And tonight is made possible by Columbia Bank, the Port of Tacoma, and of course, Tacoma Creates. And tonight, oh man, we are talking about one of the most passionate, one of the most exciting, and one of the most fundamental topics in all of Tacoma, which is trains. If you're not a train fan, I hope you will be soon. I'm not even talking about the band. I'm talking about that method of transportation and moving cargo that is so beloved to our region and is in fact the reason that Tacoma is the city that it is today. And hopefully you'll bear with me tonight. I feel like I've already jumped the track <laughs> coming in full steam with the train puns, but I am I'm daunted. The topic of trains is so expansive that it's a lot to try and encapsulate into just a brief experience. So tonight's purpose is to give you an introduction to the trains of Tacoma and what makes the city so specifically important to trains and what makes the trains so important to the city. So there we go. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you guys are here. And if you are a, a train enthusiast, welcome. Hopefully you guys can get involved in the chat and help people understand how in-depth this topic goes. And if you've learned anything, my friends, it's that train people are very enthusiastic. When you look around Tacoma, the trains are still as prevalent today as they have ever been. We have a massive rail yard right on Port of Tacoma and the train track still follows the historic route around the city. It's not uncommon to see a lot of these uh, BNSF trains. And no wonder when you look at the map of their territory, BNSF is all throughout the region our region specifically, but also throughout town, you'll see a lot of these. These are the Tacoma Rail trains, and this is a public utility. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the only um, train that is owned by a public utility. I could be mistaken on that, but City of Tacoma's public utility runs the electricity, the water, and these red and white trains. And at one point, it just became the common sense move that the utility company should adopt their own locomotives. They're strictly used for the transportation of cargo. You might have seen these around in the area, and that is just part of our municipal services, which is so interesting to me when you look at it. And Tacoma's Rail has, I think, three divisions, and together they comprise, I believe, 20 million feet of rail equipment. That's 43 miles of track in case you're trying to conceptualize it. Or if you want to know what that would look like, um, I think it's 20 million feet is roughly the distance from Tacoma to Chicago and back. So 43 miles of track, 20 million feet of rail equipment, right? So like there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into this. And it's all taffied into the whole bigger rail picture. So when you're looking at this here, this is the BNSF rail yard. It used to be right where our Amtrak station was, kind of right down here. Amtrak has now been moved over to the Freight House Square area. But when you're looking down at it, there's a massive switching and freight yard, which has always been the case. Since Tacoma has become a city, the train has been paramount in that conversation and was the first thing that we really put time into developing, right? Oh, yes. Okay, good. So I was hoping we'd have some, some train enthusiasts on tonight. Welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. Something that's going to become evident really quickly tonight is just how insinuated into the Tacoma story trains are and how very recently even it was the biggest industry in the area. Some of my favorite stories in Tacoma are about trains. This is a picture from April 27th, 1915. This is when uh, the Tacoma, I think it was the Chamber of Commerce, but the publicity committee essentially sponsored a race from Tacoma to Mount Rainier. And they had this newly opened line and they were racing cars 
against the train. And so it was a, a race to see, it was like a real John Henry moment. Is the train or the car going to win? And so let's see, um, I'm trying to remember which car it is, but it was Mrs. O.H. Ridway in car number two here, who um, managed a speed of about 40 to 50 miles per hour on average and was just barely behind the train. The train was a Milwaukee special. <clears throat> uh, it was handled by this guy, engineer Bagley, who's, I can you see right around here, and the conductor, J.F. Beals. And the train only got there five minutes before Mrs. O.H. Ridway pulled in right behind it. And so as a gesture of good faith and knowing that trains were going to be supreme in the area, they gave Ridgeway the, the winnings, which was, believe it or not, a sack of gold, <laughs> a sack of gold totaling $1,000. Someday in my life, I would like to win a competition in which somebody just hands me a sack of gold. I feel like that is something that's missing from our day-to-day -day lives in this modern world. Now, if you would like to see just how important the train story is, you can go to the third floor of the Washington State History Museum, which has a massive miniature train set up there that really represents all of the historic elements of Tacoma. And they've mashed them together in a way that tells the story, not necessarily um, like a specific moment in time, but piecemeal. And they put pieces together that should be closer or farther apart so you can see it all. But it's spooky in its accuracy sometimes. Also, of course, the Foss Waterway Seaport Museum has one of my favorite train displays, and theirs is set up right next to the historic track. So if you would like to look out the window and see Half Moon Bay, once the largest switching yard west of the Mississippi, as a train rolls past on its way to pick up grain, no better place to do that than an old shipping warehouse. And in case you haven't heard me say it, which I feel like I say it at least daily, the Foss Waterway Seaport Museum is of course in the last remaining section of what was once the longest grain warehouse in the world. Constructed in 1900, it was built for the railroad here and is one of the reasons we have the nickname City of Destiny where rails meet sails. Obviously, I'm a big fan of the seaport, <laughs> but I'm not alone in that. Though a lot of people were huge boosters for the city of Tacoma, including one of the other famous trains in the region, George Francis Train. If you don't know George Francis Train, what a legend. He was a financier for the railroad. He was a brief candidate for president of the United States. He was a wealthy millionaire investor, eccentric traveler, and at one point campaigned to be, I'm not exaggerating, emperor of the United States. And when he went on his campaigns, he would do these eccentric things like, he'd be like, well, I learned in China to not shake hands with people, but I will shake hands with myself. And that was his thing that he would do. What? Uh, what an absolute icon. He ended up being committed into an insane asylum, but you never really know. <laughs> but he is actually the origin story for Around the World in 80 Days. When George took many trips around the world, he set a record by going around the world, circumnavigating it very, very quickly. And that inspired Jules Verne to write Around the World in 80 Days. And then later in 1890, Nellie Bly, a journalist, traveled around the world in 72 days, which beat George Francis Train's old record. And so he, not wanting to stand for that, decided to do a second circumnavigation. And he left from Tacoma. And then 67 days, 12 hours, and one minute later, arrived back in Tacoma, where the trip began in 1890. And this is part of the Tacoma legacy. And one of the reasons he was such a big fan of this city is its connection to train history. If you're not already aware, the city of Tacoma was selected to be the terminus for the transcontinental Northern Pacific route. So its main line, you can see here, went from the Chicago Great Lakes area all the way over to Tacoma, but was connected via track all the way over to New York. 
And so by 1870, when that telegraph went out, the Northern Pacific Railroad immediately set to expanding their line so that they could arrive in Tacoma. And that was the hub. That was the city totally eclipsing all the other cities in Washington and its importance for that period of time. Now, you may have noticed times have changed. There are other larger, maybe wealthier cities, but that that honor and legacy remains in Tacoma. And our fate and fortune has always been tied to the railroad. When you see the Northern Pacific start to expand, you can also see it transform. The Northern Pacific was headquartered in Minnesota, and then I think by the end of it, it was in St. Paul, Minnesota. But it was like all railroads at the time, tumultuous in its financial history. I don't know how you guys feel about historic fiction, but one of my absolute favorite shows and definitely train related is Hell on Wheels. Ah, 10 out of 10, no notes, great show. And I think gives you the perfect flavor of what that train expansion across the country was like. And while it doesn't focus on Tacoma at all, the, the theory is still invested in that. The Northern Pacific eventually turns into Burlington Northern, which then forms a partnership with Santa Fe. And then today we have BNSF. And so you see the train line in Tacoma change a few times, not only Northern Pacific, but also Union Pacific is well represented here. And when you look at places that are important to the train history here, like Union Station, you'll see the Northern Pacific logo, this yin yang merge design here represented throughout. So when you're inside Union Station, it still has the Northern Pacific logo right back there. Not to mention, it's just a jaw-dropping building. And after it was refurbished, once being turned into a federal courthouse, a lot of this Chihuly glass obviously went inside. If you're ever interested in visiting this iconic train station, now no longer a train station, you can go any day that the court is open, just show a piece of ID to the, the guard at the front and he'll let you in. And man, I love that team there. We talk all the time, but he's he tells me that people still arrive there thinking that it is the Amtrak station. So, oh my gosh. So sorry. Um, this is Fenrir. He would really like to say hello to everyone tonight. Now that he's seen you, hopefully he can be calm. And yeah, um, a lot of public events happen there now. Proms, homecomings. Oh, I'm trying. I think it was the Steve Miller Band. I just learned this. The Steve Miller Band has a music video that they shot in Union Station. I'm going to find it for you guys and, and put it up later. But if you don't want to just go into Union Station, you can also see it represented at the Washington State History Museum's miniature display. And like I said, uncanny detail. This is a, an exact replica of Union Station. But, um, <laughs> Oh, I see. Everybody's just here for the cat. I'll I'll bring him back around in a second. I'm sure he's not going to be able to to stay away. And yes, that's the thing, right? Phoenix, Arizona, all the way to Tacoma, and round up there in Union Station. Um, yeah, the Amtrak station. Well, the one that we just previously had, which we'll see here in a little bit, was abysmal. Uh, I like the historic elements we have of the new one, and I think it's a, a classy station, but it's not anything near what what Union Station is. I mean, Union Station was designed by Reed and Stem, the same architects that did Grand Central Terminal. And in my mind, is this bookend to the nation. You could get in one station and then teleport, essentially, across the country without dying of dysentery into a similar station. What a treat, what a delight. <laughs> <clears throat> but how did we get here? That's that's our journey today. So before Union Station, here is one of the earliest, if not the earliest photographs of Tacoma. This is one I found, it's uh, from 1873, I believe, looking out as the railroad develops their interests. They've gone through, they've claimed Puyallup territory, and they are turning it into this tub, uh, terminus, this hub. And the first train station, which isn't usually considered a train station, is the Blackwell. 
The Blackwell Hotel opened in 1874, and uh, the Blackwells were the first two people to ever arrive in Tacoma on a train. I mean it, like the train had to stop as it was arriving in Tacoma. The engineer got out to make sure that the track had been finished before pulling the train forward. And William and Alice Blackwell were the only two people on board, along with all the furniture that they brought to start running this building right here, the Blackwell Hotel, which was a train depot, train station, and hotel for the interests of the Northern Pacific. And Blackwell had just come up from Kalama, Kalama, however you want it, and designed that whole town really in his image, ran a tight ship there. So the Northern Pacific sent him up to their most important asset at the time. And here's another picture that the Blackwell's up on this dock and you could see the ships were coming up to the side and then the trains were just right here along the ridge. Now up here on the edge, this is later gonna become Stadium High School. The Blackwell Hotel is no longer around today, but would have been essentially where Schuster Parkway is right now. And when you look at it, you could see through its time, it was aquatic at best. In fact, when William and Alice first arrived on the train, they had to get off and then be rowed <laughs> to the point where the tide should have gone up to the edge of the hotel, but it was low tide, so they walked. Here's one of the Sanborn fire insurance maps. And so you can see the Blackwell here, and then the train as it comes out over Commencement Bay. Our second train station though, is also <laughs> not around, but would have been located right here. So if you know the University of Washington campus or Koi Sushi, Right here is this building. It's currently the, the Milgard Family Foundation building, and it was built on top of the Northern Pacific Railroad Passenger Terminal, better known as the Villard Depot, which was constructed in 1883. And then by 1892, they moved the passenger terminal across the street. So you can see where, well here, I'll highlight it. This is where the depot was. They moved it across Pacific Avenue to here. So in 1892, this is what our train station looked like. You can see, well, this is the, the bookstore for the University of Washington Tacoma campus right now. You can see the West Coast Grocery Building right here. Uh, you can see the old courthouse, rest its soul. And Tacoma was blossoming up here. Now, what I love about this picture though, is that it is one part photograph, one part illustration. Uh, they took this picture and then they had someone just like fill in the details in the background here, chef's kiss. But 1892, this was our main passenger terminal downtown. And you can see it listed here on the Sanborn map. So ice storage, turntable, repair shop, and that's the thing, the train depot shed next to the passenger terminal, we were a one-stop shop. Not only was Tacoma the terminus for all the trains coming and going throughout the region, but we were the, the shops. This is where the Northern Pacific set up camp that was designing the trains, building the trains and repairing the trains. And so for a period of time, uh, this was the largest northern pacific rail yard west of the mississippi i'm gonna stop at least five of you right now i know there's foamers in the group that are going to be like chris you need to check your facts the largest rail yard west of the mississippi was in spokane yeah for the great northern that was true the great northern had a larger operation in both i believe acreage and like tonnage of trains that were coming and going but for the Northern Pacific, which is what we're talking about here, it was all in eventually what became South Tacoma Way or the Edison neighborhood. Got to catch, got to catch my, my naysayers quick here. Can you tell it's happened before? So <clears throat> eventually early 1900s, Union Station is envisioned by the city of Tacoma and then starts its journey opening its doors, I believe in 1911 for the first time. And we're very fortunate to have it today. It's an absolute icon. And the last train 
that was carrying passengers left from this building in the 1980s. And then it laid essentially derelict for a long period of time, thus prompting Steve Miller to shoot a few music videos in it, at least one. <clears throat> but when the federal government came in and leased it, it got a new <laughs> lease on life and we get to keep it in the area today, surviving that tumultuous period in the late 80s, early 90s in Tacoma, which I'll be the first to tell you, the late 80s, early 90s was not Tacoma's it girl era. This was not when the city was thriving, but we're having a renaissance. When you look at both the miniature in the Washington State History Museum and the building itself, you get to see a lot of the fine details of that building. Also, just while I have you here talking about the miniature at Washington State History Museum, their replica of the spar is unbelievable. <laughs> if, you've, if you've not been to the spar recently, the spar is technically Tacoma's oldest um, bar that's been in continual operation. <clears throat> and this is, this is what it looks like. Like here's a picture of that billiards room now. This is what it looks like in the imagining. This is what it has always been, really. And I, I love that. But <clears throat> the, the Northern Pacific poured all this time and interest into Tacoma. And the biggest development was in steam trains. Uh, this I love this shot of locomotive 1783 on the turntable here. And what I think is absolutely hilarious is that in the beginning days of rail transportation with Tacoma and Seattle, because Tacoma was the bell of the ball, Seattle was this like impoverished nowheresville up north, and they didn't have a turntable. So you could ride the train backwards up to Seattle like a pleb, and then you could ride it out of Seattle forward facing like a gentleman. And there was a period of time where Tacoma designed their train schedule so that if you ever arrived from Seattle to Tacoma, which uh, was the only way to get out of town, you would arrive in Tacoma by the time that the last trains had left. <laughs> and so you'd have to stay overnight in Tacoma before you could disembark again on your journey. And what a delight. Eventually, the tracks um, snaked all over. The Cascade Path was opened eventually. A lot of that is still up there and has great stories attached to it. I'll link you guys to a whole uh, virtual tour I've done previously, basically just about the expansion of the train over and through the Cascades. But for a long period of time, the only way to get the train was to go straight south and then over the Columbia River. And before the train bridges were constructed over the Columbia, you would take a ferry. And I'm so sorry, I didn't think to add an image of the train ferry in the deck tonight, but I will, I'll find it and share it later. It is exactly what it sounds like. They would drive one section of a time onto this barge, essentially, and then take it across the river, which in some places they still do today, very less frequently. But um, it's always harrowing to both see and think about, for me, honestly. <clears throat> when you look back through the history of Tacoma, it's not just the Northern Pacific, but obviously the Union Pacific as well had a vested interest in the area and their freight house down on the port. And this, by the way, is a picture of Port of Tacoma from ooh, later in the game. I'm trying to remember when this one was, way later than I expected, like 1980s almost but I'll have to double check on that. <clears throat> um, when you're looking at the other ones, there are uh, just phenomenal shots of the rail yards in South Tacoma Way. And in 1908, the Northern Pacific uh, had tons of shops doing repairs on all of these trains. And the amount of people employed was staggering because you had to have people skilled in every possible part of the engineering of one of these. But also it, when you're running a steam train, it just takes an amazing amount of labor to keep one of those in perpetual motion. <clears throat> but they were doing it. It was beloved throughout the community as well. This is one of my favorite shots. This is from March of 1949, where almost 60 children went on a field trip to essentially be like, hey kids, trains, 
are your bread and butter. They're the reason you exist. And they're not wrong. So much of the employment in Tacoma, I mean, I will say almost exclusively all of the employment in Tacoma was bound to the train. Not just that people were working on the trains, but people were arriving on the trains. They were dependent on their livelihoods and their businesses and their supplies arriving and departing via train. And so when you look at these train shops and yards, most of which are no longer there today, <clears throat> um, some of these, you know, there's at least one brick building along the Sounder line that is an old freight warehouse and is now being used as an event space in South Tacoma Way. But most of these were demolished, unfortunately. There are other parts of the train history that are no longer today. This is representative. This is not an actual picture. This is an actual picture of the train tunnel that has haunted the memories of so many people and certainly the fantasies of others. <clears throat> in the early 1900s, I believe 1910, the Union Pacific wanted to become more competitive in the freight industry. And what was slowing them down is that to get in and out of Tacoma, there were these steep grades. And so they're like, here's what we could do. Why don't we dig this tunnel underground that will allow the train to hit a flat grade? And I've got a little map for you here. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll share the link to this site. There's a phenomenal article, um, I'm going to send it right now, from groupssa.com that really gets into the in-depth, deep history of the train tunnel. And the red line represents the, the line that they were going to try and dig. The blue line represents how far they got with this tunnel. But the thing was, it flooded. The, the Tacoma water table is surprisingly high up and you don't have to go very far underground before you get a lot of water. Plus all of the ground, based on my understanding here, is incredibly porous. So if it rains, which you may have noticed, it does occasionally in Tacoma, your tunnels will continue to flood as well. This is something that we have problems with in basements in downtown Tacoma. It's something that was an indomitable issue for the engineering team digging this tunnel. So it got filled in. <clears throat> Granted, not in its entirety. When they were putting a bridge across I-5, one of the supports for that bridge was inadvertently placed in one of the empty cavernous sections of this abandoned tunnel. This is the only picture I have ever seen of that Yakima Avenue tunnel being put in, but the legend exists forever and always. People, however, often get it confused with this tunnel. This is the Nelson Bennett Tunnel. Uh, you can see right down here at the bottom of this photograph, this is Salmon Beach. And so this is the um, northern facing route up towards Point Defiance. And to <clears throat> get the train around Tacoma. If you've ever been on Ruston Way, you've seen the train go by, but then you never see it when you're out at Point Defiance, and that's because it goes underground for over a mile and then emerges on the other side of the Tacoma Peninsula and then continues south by Salmon Beach, going through that tunnel. And when people talk about the Yakima Tunnel, I think the image of it, where it would have been along I-5, gets conflated with the one that currently runs from Ruston Way, essentially, over to the other side of Tacoma and then down along throughout Stilicum. <clears throat> I hope that made sense and I didn't make it worse. You can see Tacoma's obsession with trains everywhere, too. This is Funland. If you don't know Funland, wow. Funland was part of the Point Defiance Park system when a Sarko was creating fine copper for the world. They also created a tremendous amount of molten lead and arsenic, which they dumped into Puget Sound, and that created a peninsula that is now Dune Peninsula Park. And on that, for a period of time, was a place called Funland. <laughs> so down here, <clears throat> this is just uh, lead and arsenic dust, no big deal. But they built a, a model train running around there in Funland for quite some time. 
<clears throat> what I love about this is that this picture could basically be now. If you've never gone out and done the Kitsap live steamers on Kitsap Peninsula, you are missing out, my friends. There is a group of train enthusiasts that just out of the passionate fires of their hearts maintains a fleet, an armada. What do you call a group of trains? I don't know. A, a gaggle of trains out on the peninsula where they have these small tracks and then they run essentially this size here, um, steam trains, uh, diesel electric trains all out there. And then you get to sit on the back and ride them through the woods. It is just delightful. When you're looking at the, the effect of trains in the area though, I want to stress how important and relevant that the train was to Tacoma. This is George Berry. He's a lamplighter, was a lamplighter for the Northern Pacific Railroad. And he would go out and light kerosene torches for, for the switching area. This picture is from 1968. 1968, we were using, um, in some places, kerosene lamps to signal the trains here in Tacoma, right? When you're looking out <coughs> at early Tacoma. This isn't even that early. Uh, <clears throat> down here was Northern Fish Co's old place. Right here, you can see Union Station. This is downtown Tacoma. And the now Foss Waterway, previously City Waterway, used to have a whole series of railroad bridges that crossed and then came up across Pacific Avenue. Right here, this is the prairie line. The prairie line is the, the trail. It's a spur line for the railroad that goes up into the belly of Tacoma. And here's a picture of the, the steam train, mind you. The steam train crossing Pacific Avenue and cars needing to stop so that passenger and freight cars could go up into the city. This is the freaking Swiss back here. This is the Snoqualmie power substation <clears throat> like <laughs> the train was the needle and thread that stitched this city together heart and soul and when you walk on university of washington's campus today it has tracks in the ground that i think people rarely think about but those were in the not too distant past the very lifeline that carried freight in and out of the city They've done a very good job of putting interpretive art along the Prairie Line Trail today so that you get to see a lot of that story. This one is particularly about the Chinese migrants to the area who were instrumental in creating the railroad before they were expelled in 1885. <clears throat> but there's more than just this. The, the codes of Tacoma's train industry are abundant. Yes, thank you, Faye. 1993, 93, which I know, I know, I'm, I'm an elder millennial now, and um, thank you for letting me know that's a switch indicator lamp. <clears throat> At this point, 93 was a while ago, but not, not so distant as people sometimes think. And so, I, I really want to stress the fact that the, the train history is still alive in Tacoma and the, the ancient train history, the first train history was still very much active until the very recent past for Tacoma. If you're downtown, you've probably seen this gorgeous structure before, constructed in 1888. This is the headquarters, the former headquarters for the Northern Pacific Railroad. And this once housed the offices for the Warehouser Corporation, as well as all the main offices for the railroad. And they absolutely terraformed this hill and area because directly beneath it was this, Half Moon Bay. And you can see it was difficult to get a train around it. They had to build this earthworks up along it, but with tidal patterns, it became a mess. So they, <clears throat> did what they did best and sluiced it. 
They created all of this sediment flow down into the area, filled it in with the top of the hill and created Half Moon Yard. Half Moon Yard went on to become the largest switching yard in on the West Coast for a long period of time there. And this picture is a great transitional one because you get to see it right at its peak because by 1900, that world's longest grain storage warehouse, all of the furniture manufacturing, Port of Tacoma, everything over here had been installed. Old City Hall showed up by 1893. This was now a completely different area. But when you look back at what this was before the railroad, it's, it's staggering to see the side by side. And again, the, the building that's down there today, the Foss Watery Seaport, is the last section of that grain warehouse. And you can see it, you know, throughout history here. It too had a, a dark time where it was basically a derelict and abandoned building. Certainly a far cry from its glorious time as a wheat storage place. In case you are curious, this is where my obsession with rats and rat control came from. Someone on a tour of that building once asked me, how did they control the rats? And well, they didn't. <laughs> they have been trying to figure out the best way to eradicate them. And yeah, God, I'm uncontrollable tonight. But uh, through the dedicated work of community members, the Foss Waterway Seaport has been turned into this exquisite building today. And now gets to serve as, as a reminder to what the space used to be. And what I love is it's got all those original trusses up there built by the railroad originally. So you can see here what they were kind of working with. This is essentially where Taya Foss Park would be today. And you can see all that area just built out on top of the water. But they remain. Not just the Northern Pacific headquarters, but also the seaport down there on the water. And they are reminders of this network. <clears throat> One of the things I love is that when you look at a map of Washington state and you look at where all the towns are, they are 98% of the time there because that's where the train went through. And so all those towns ended up being connected. When you look today at a rail map of Washington, sure enough, the vast majority of towns, you know, leaving Spokane, working your way across, um, <clears throat> like the Highway 2 route, Elmira, Afreda, Wenatchee, Leavenworth, Everett, Monroe, or down along through the Tri-Cities, Richland, Pasco, Kennewick, and then up through Ellensburg, and then eventually over and across. These are all the traditional rail lines. The, the latest railroad to the game in the like early chapters right was the chicago milwaukee st paul and pacific railroad and they started running trains from tacoma in 1909 <clears throat> which i believe is the same time that freight house square was constructed not originally called that it was called the milwaukee freight house <clears throat> or the milwaukee road freight house chicago milwaukee and st paul railway and this was originally 540 feet by 50 feet. They built an addition to it in the 1940s. Then, oh God, I think it was the late 70s, early 80s. This too was abandoned and got its first uh, sort of re-envisioning with a cinnamon roll bakery inside. Someone had the brilliant idea of making cinnamon rolls right next to Port of Tacoma and their longshoremen, and hey presto, they became rich. But the St. Paul Milwaukee Railroad was very innovative for the region because in the 1920s, they started operating electric trains. <clears throat> now, the, the powering of trains has changed dramatically over the years. Obviously, steam trains were the first to the area here, often powered by wood fires and then coal fire, uh, coke fires, uh, oil fires for a long period of time there. It really depends. Diesel electric is the most often type of train you see today. A diesel generator powers the electric engine in a train. But 
these were electric trains, very much how you would envision them in like downtown Seattle or something, where they had a power line here. This is from March 5th, 1920. This is the electric powered Olympian, and it's leaving Tacoma in 1920, making history because it is the formal opening of the Cascade Division of electrically operated trains. It had a 3000 volt current supplied by glacier streams and allowed these passenger and freight trains to move over the Cascades. 3000 volts uh, pumped through those wires up top, brought down into the train, and then that would power the engine all the way across. And like, boom absolute game changer for the area utilizing once again the hydroelectric power that made this region so well powerful <clears throat> here's another one of it and this instantly became iconic for the region the olympian and the olympian hiawatha the the hiawatha um is this one right here also run by the milwaukee railroad which was a streamliner if you've never heard the streamliner song YouTube it when we're done here. It's going to be stuck in your head for days. But the the uh, Milwaukee Railroad's Olympia Hiawatha would run between Tacoma and Chicago and would make the run between those two cities in 45 hours, which, if you're not familiar with this, was 14 hours less than any train was able to do it previously. Plus... Not only was it sexy to look at, but every car was air conditioned. So if you wanted to go from Tacoma to Chicago, you were going to do it in style. And so the Olympia, Hiawatha, Olympia Hiawatha was the train and, and was a legend for the area. That's why here in the Rhodes department store, they're getting these kids hooked on train travel early. Well, I don't know about this girl. She looks skeptical. <clears throat> Everybody else is blown away. This kid can hardly believe that he's still being considered a kid, but everybody else is having the best time of their lives. Look at the envy on this kid's face. He is green. The Milwaukee Railroad pioneered this electric locomotive in the region here and then left their mark with this $150,000 passenger depot, which uh, would have been located essentially down in Port of Tacoma. I'm trying to think. I don't know if I have a shot. It's not like an attractive area today, but no offense, Port of Tacoma. But when this opened in 1954, <clears throat> again, very exciting for the people of Tacoma because it allowed them to move in and out of the city very quickly and efficiently. And what allowed Tacoma to stay relevant was, like so many things, uh, Joint Base lewis McCord or Fort Lewis, Camp Lewis, depending when we're talking about in history. The, the age of rail travel kind of ebbed in, in the 1930s, and then you saw more automobile and bus traffic taking its place. But Tacoma remained relevant because so many soldiers were getting shipped down or up, and World War II, for example, was a big driving engine for that. And having all these passenger trains was essential, which is why you see even this is from 1978's Daffodil Parade, our love of trains still out on the street there. And why not? It's in our blood. This is the Seattle Tacoma Limited. This is an electric streetcar that ran from, if you've ever seen that triangle building <clears throat> alongside Firefighters Park, just kind of at the back of Matador, that was the hub where you could get in one of these real attractive chair cars and then ride an electric streetcar all the way up to Seattle from Tacoma, which is mind blowing. You might be asking yourself, Chris, where did we go wrong? Well, in 1938, the city made the decision to disassemble the tracks and sell the steel to Japan uh, because they're like, they need it for the wartime effort. <laughs> Don't worry, we got it back. Anyhow, um, the, the streetcar, is just now making its renaissance. If you haven't ridden the Sound Transit leak downtown, this is our homage to the streetcar that used to run down here. When you look at 
the train passing in front of Union Station, bear in mind, we have not reinvented the wheel. We've only put a new coat of paint on what we've been doing since the 1870s. When you look at the Amtrak station, the final stop for the Link Light Rail here in Tacoma, this is the new train station for the Amtrak. It's also where the Sounder, the commuter train, departs. It's in Freight House Square, the original St. Paul, Milwaukee Railroad Freight House. We have only changed the color scheme. We have not created something new per se. Tacoma is, right? This is Half Moon Bay. When you look at this shot, Old City Hall, the Northern Pacific Railroad headquarters, the 11th Street lift bridge, the, the old grain warehouse. This is over 100 years time difference, like 150 years, I think, actually, since this was all established in the area, and it is as if nothing has changed. When you look at the train yard, it is very much still the lifeblood and current of this region. It is the reason we have a Tacoma. And what I like about this one is you can actually see the old historic round table and the switching yards here framed eloquently by not just the Foss Waterway and the Tacoma Dome, but Mount Rainier proudly looking over it all. So hopefully this has reminded you just how important trains are to the region. Certainly Fenrir agrees. <laughs> he is such a booster. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. I would encourage you, go out, Foss Waterway Seaport, Washington State History Museum, dig a little deeper into the train legacy in this region. And if I may, I would say walk Prairie Line. Uh, just go up and down there and look at the old warehouses that, that gave the city the economic engine that it has and see the veins that connected that beating heart to the rest of the world. So shoot. If you guys have questions, let me know. And um, if not, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Get on out there. Keep on exploring.